Uh, so I'm John Curtin, and I happen to be part of a very exciting space here that all of you are attending. And I am specifically co-founder of Large Albedo Informatics. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what we are and what we stand for. So Large was created to really sort of focus on three main things that have been missing from the space in general. And so we look to say, you know, what is out there? What can we do? And we see the space as missing these three things, which is location, gaming, and augmented reality. So with those three pillars, we're unifying them ultimately so that the user experience can leverage them and do something really magical and amazing. So we're seeing some magic today. We're hearing about magic today. This is about enabling that magic. And we've been working recklessly on this and damn hard for probably, I don't know, two years now or so. So the goal of it with essentially these three pillars is that we want to take this and we want to give the power to you. So right now everybody's looking, how do I leverage this? How do I do this? How do I get this crazy content? How do I push it out there? What can I do? How can I make it my own? How can I take it beyond just having simple narcissistic selfies with a bunch of little ears on me? How can I make it more immersive and really dramatic and powerful and exciting? And that's what this is really about and that's what large is. So do we think we're on the right track? Um, we've been talking, we've been hearing about ARKit I'll tell you, I, I know we're on the right track. We're damn right on the right track because we're looking at somebody like Apple. So Apple makes obscene amounts of money and Apple is focused on how do they go to market and protect everything that they've done and work so tirelessly to protect and grow with. Okay, Newton aside. So that being said, they're looking at what the future holds. And I think we've heard today a lot about what the future holds. So ARKit is part of it. Hearing the rumblings of what the new iPhone is going to look like, everyone's already kind of going into their bank account and saying, I'm going to save a thousand bucks to go pick up my next iPhone. And for us, we look at this as part of something called the supranet. So what's the supranet? To us, the supranet is essentially taking everything that's the internet and layering it on top of your physical space. So now you're not just interacting with your physical space, looking around and walking down the street, and it's all very cool. All of a sudden, you've got an immersive living experience that goes above and beyond, transcends anything that you're actually seeing in a physical world that's now part of the internet. And you're now actually working and living within it. And this is what we are tapping into, and this is the goal of large. So now when we look at a little bit of some of the capabilities of large. So we got this platform, this powerful platform that we've created so that we can do some pretty magical things with it. So I'm going to take you for a little bit of a sneak peek, if you will, under the covers of what's coming and what we're doing here at Large HQ in Toronto. So first off, we got the Large Messenger, where it enables the creation of pops. So think of amazing, dramatic, immersive content. Again, we're not just talking about flat stuff and little imagery and whatever. Make it your own, your own identity. So now you're actually taking things that are unique. Pictures, videos, selfies if you want. Um, immersive 360 content, art, art that's been populated that we have enabled so that you can take it and dramatically create again some of these scenes or pops. Those pops, well where are they? You want to see them, you want to go to them, well, they're all locatively tagged. So now you can actually see them, you can go to them, you can hunt for them, you can share, you can explore. It's about enjoying and taking in that content and finding it in many ways. And frankly, we can gamify all of it because again, this is part of the three pillars that we sought out for. Your usual little space, whatever it may be, you know, people are looking, you go to eat something, here's some Taiwanese food. Again, the content is there, the location, and the capabilities. So just to give a sense of, as we wrap up, just kind of where we're at and what we're doing on the timeline. So our first goal and what is coming pretty soon in September, we're gonna be doing sort of a soft beta launch, if you will, coming up this September. Beyond that, when we think of ARKit and we think of IOS, so IOS is gonna be coming shortly thereafter in October. Beyond that, then we're gonna start picking very low, uh, special you know, cities or, or localities that we decide we're going to be rolling this out again with the consideration of kind of where we're going and then eventually the idea of global and sharing with everyone. 
So what are we looking for? So all of you are kind of thinking, well, you know, how can I leverage this? How can I get into this? Or what can I so I'll tell you what we're looking for, content. So AR is only as good as what people can see. And we are looking for some dramatic, powerful, amazing content. We're looking for partners. We're looking at ad agencies. We're looking at people that actually want to be able to contribute, leverage the platform. And that's what we're here. So if you want to come see me afterward and get your beer first, that's fine. Um, and then let's talk. And obviously, we're hiring. So anybody in here that has, if you understand what that is, um, and, and somebody, because I, I tell you, I'm not even sure half the time. But anyway, if you understand what those things are, then probably you're right. You should come see me, or at the very least, I should get you talking to my tech guys. Anyway, that's a little window into it. Go to thisislarge.com. Gives you a little bit more. Love to talk with you in person. Thanks for the opportunity, Tom. Thanks, Ben. Uh, in 2001, I helped co-found an organization called Interactive Ontario. At the time, it was just a ragtag group of digital media entrepreneurs and getting together like this and putting our heads together and sharing ideas is just so important to the growth of an industry. So what you're doing is really awesome. Thank you. So I'm Ian Kelso, co-founder of Impossible Things. And we are all about the art and science of meaningful use of AR. And that means the AR has got to do something. It's got to add value. So we're a solution-based company. We have, and I know everybody says this, but we have a truly awesome team, uh, which has not just great depth in working in augmented reality, but that goes back to some of the early days of the internet itself, or at least of the web in, in the mid-early 90s. We've worked with a lot of really cool and uh, well-known brands, and uh, we're doing some research right now with a, a number of academic institutions, uh, OCAD, University of Toronto, and George Brown, to name three. So I want to talk to you about uh, our current project and how we formed Impossible Things. And we can say we did it all in 17 seconds. Well, we didn't form the company in 17 seconds, but it was pretty quick when we learned the fact that the average time that a person looks at a piece of art in an, a gallery and that includes something like the Mona Lisa, is only 17 seconds. And we thought, that's horrible. Blame Instagram. You know, people don't stop, pause, and reflect on images anymore. You know, they scan, they rate, and they move on. So this photo, I think, says it all, right? But it's not what you think. This group of teenagers playing on their phones are not texting, sitting under that fine Rembrandt, they're actually using the museum's app, which is a good and a bad thing. It's good, because they actually are engaging, but it's bad because they're looking down, they're not working directly with the art, and they're just consuming information. You can do that at home. So we saw that as an opportunity. So we, we made a prototype, and we went to the Art Gallery of Ontario, and we showed it to them. It was called Reblink, and they bought it. Kind of scary. <laughs> so Reblink is all about looking up. It's about the experience. It's about engaging directly with the art. We call these remixes. This is a first way of interacting with art. And what we're doing is basically taking classic paintings and giving them a modern spin, sort of putting a modern lens on it. So it's kind of art helping you to engage with art. And it's kind of fun, and this particular piece is the Marquesa Contessa. I don't know if any of you are members of the AGO, or if you, you've been recently, you may recognize this work. It's, it's one of the most famous. The Marquesa was actually a early 20th century debutante, celebrity, and uh, a known narcissist. So she's kind of the Kardashian of her day. So giving her a selfie stick um, is not actually a gimmick. It's actually true to the, the story behind the, that piece of art. We did a lot of experimentation in both 2D and 3D in rendering scenes, and the word, the phrase digital presence came up. We worked a lot with digital presence and finding those little things that made you feel like that thing was really there or the, really the crux of it being that it was really aware of you being there. So we, in this case here, this is a, a very famous um, French-Canadian painting. The figure follows you around the room and he actually starts talking about you based on where you are. So, as Helen said, what we ultimately 
set it to do is to create kick-ass experiences that were also great solutions to create engagement in the gallery setting to make sure that people could use their devices sort of ironically to engage back with the artwork. Um, we've been overwhelmed with the kind of attention that we've gotten over the last few weeks. We just launched on July the 5th at the AGO and um, we've been written up in about probably about 50 different uh, uh, websites and, and new services and uh, we hit a milestone today we actually have uh, now one million views um, of our videos on Facebook. So, yeah. so from here on out, what we're doing is we're creating a platform, and a platform that includes that remix, but also with another set of ser series of interactions to help you get more information, education, that works directly with the art. That's a looking forward experience, not a looking down experience. So for example, this is what we call the review lens. So you can leave your review of a, a painting and you can see what the average reviews of other people are by looking at you know, how bright the sun is shining from the painting. Or maybe there's a dark thundercloud over top of it. Um, the x-ray lens, which is you know, a really easy but awesome way of looking below the layers of paint on a painting. And so we're looking to hook in with the museum's current collection management systems and all of their communications and event platforms. And um, we're kind of at a sweet spot between augmented reality platforms, collection management software, and visitor engagement solutions. And from here, um, we've actually been not specifically continuing to concentrate on the museum industry, because it's you know, a little small and it's a, it's a little slow to grow. But we're taking what we've learned and we've been applying it to things like public transportation and saying, can we use Pokemon Go type experiences to change the way that people use the system and change the load at the time of day and the routes people take? Um, and another really fun, fascinating project, 27% of kids in the US are being treated for chronic illness and are taking drugs. And 75% of them don't take their drugs on time. So can we help to motivate kids to take care and to manage their own health care. So that's a very small sneak peek. We're doing a demo here in a few minutes. Um, please come up, we've got a few iPads. And thank you very much for the opportunity, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for coming. All right, I'll try to keep this brief. My name is Pete, I am the CEO of It's Me. And my intention is to live forever. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how I plan to do that. So it's been a pretty crazy news week. The guy from Glen Gary, Glenn Ross, didn't make it 11 days in the White House. <laughs> and there's been some bad news in the form of Altspace VR. Uh, just show of hands, Altspace users. And so, uh, did you download it and try it, or did you keep coming back for more? Yeah, that's what I thought. So, when I was looking for answers, I wanted to know why, why did this company fail? And I don't want to kick them while they're down, but there's two themes that seem to have emerged. Um, the first is that they have these cartoony avatars that don't evoke any kind of uh, empathetic reaction. The second is that uh, there's this really toxic masculine sexist culture that makes people feel really deeply unwelcome. I mean, hell, I felt pretty unwelcome. And I think that this is a, a real failure of them to capture um, the empathy of the people who could be using that platform. If you look at tools like Second Life, they actually gave people the ability uh, to be more empathetic with each other. And that's something that never really made it into that platform. And I think that it made it easier for trolls to sort of forget that they're dealing with humans that are on the other side of all those characters. Facebook is doing a little bit better. Um, this is actually something they just announced where they show uh, this is a person's profile picture and this is the avatar that they were able to generate from it. Um, still, it's pretty cartoony. It doesn't really do it for me. And you'd never look at that person and say, oh, that's, that's my friend Beth. And this is all pretty weird to me because one of the smartest guys in the industry um, is this guy, Michael Abrash, and he's like obsessed with high resolution virtual humans. So you'd think that, that Facebook would be taking that more seriously. I guess I'm just very motivated by the idea that, um, that avatars should absolutely look like us, that, that this is something that just makes sense and uh, that it's actually kind of obvious in hindsight. So I believe that VR absolutely can make the world a better place, but only if it enables and facilitates us to communicate, understand, and ultimately empathize with each other a lot better than we currently do. And I know this 
because my company, It's Me, has spent the last three and a half years creating a solution to one of the most difficult social and technical problems facing our entire industry. And that is, could we be using lifelike avatars to exist in virtual spaces? Could we do this in a way that is accessible to everyone in the developed world? And uh, can we build a 100-year company that taps into the like, tens of billions of dollars worth of money that's being spent on you know, in-game items and in-app purchases? And I think that we've cracked that nut. My company has created an incredible technology that can create a full-body avatar with, at minimum, a single shot taken on a smartphone or laptop camera. There's no special hardware required. So this is a process that's fully automated. It only takes a couple of seconds. It's free. And we're actually working to get it so that you don't even need an account to get started. You can just jump in, casually create an avatar, and be using whatever application you want to be using. Um, for you Unity developers, we've gotten the integration process so tight and so short that it shouldn't take more than a couple of hours to get avatars working in the context of your application. And I'd love to hear from anyone in the room who's working on a game or a painting application or a uh, enterprise collaboration tool uh, that would benefit from having virtual humans embedded. I just wanted to say that was a really cool demo, guys. I was really into it. Um, I think it's just true that all these AIs, all these chatbots that are coming in, the reason that people are going to interact and engage with those tools is because they look like us. Babies do it. <laughs> so we've already scanned 12,000 people, mostly in Canada. We've done some cross-country tours. And um, we've learned a couple things along the way. Um, we realized that uh, when you're in an interactive experience with someone's avatar, you don't just recognize the people that you see. You actually feel like you're there with them. It takes a couple of minutes, but then you sort of forget that you're just talking to a representation of your friend. So in hindsight, it's not for you to have an avatar that looks like you. It's, it's for the people that you love and the people that love you. So we've realized as we've done this that we're not just creating a technology that can allow the world to represent themselves digitally and virtually the way that we appear in real life. We've actually taken the first steps towards making loneliness an avoidable problem. Uh, if you miss someone, you should feel like you're there with them. And it's something that we can do. Whether they're on a chip or even if they've died, and I want to stress that uh, this isn't for every application. We're just giving the world and our society a new special ability that we've never had before, which is to be able to casually make avatars for everyone. So we intend to launch uh, a productized version of the technology that we built in January at CES in Vegas. Our hope and our, our intention, and I actually believe this could be very conservative, is that we intend to capture 10 million people next year. And to get that started, we're going to be raising a couple million dollars in a few months. We want to grow our team and expand the types of integrations that we're able to do. Obviously, we're really interested in the AR kit, and I slipped in a secret fourth AR kit demo because uh, I really love showing off Tom's avatar whenever I can. <laughs> um, zombie Pete, which is typical Pete if you know me. There are going to be 500 million devices AR kit compatible over roughly a week after iOS 11 comes out. And that's a, a mind-boggling opportunity. And we can't wait to see the thousands of applications that people will use avatars to make. It'll make Pokemon Go look like small fried potatoes, which is a thing that I just invented. Um, and just to wrap up, uh, this is an application. It's actually the first game that uses It's Me's avatar technology. It's called Drunken Bar Fight, and I'm about to get my ass kicked. Oh. So uh, the, the, coming to a VR, House of VR Arcade soon. Um, but in the meantime, please, uh, actually, if my two partners could stick up their hands in the back there. Um, I'm talking to you guys. Go like this. So any of the three of us, we're excited to talk to you about uh, avatar applications. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.